Hello, I'm Professor Arnold Dix. I'm a specialist in the subsurface and I'm speaking to you today about the transition from the Arab Spring, this incredible uh, appetite and uh, uh, development of subsurface infrastructure we're experiencing and the transition to what I've described as the autumn as we move from the construction into sustainable, safe operations. By way of background, I've been a specialist in this area for almost 30 years, scientist, lawyer, sit on most of the world's peak, peak governing bodies for writing standards and what have you for safe operations underground. I'm a prolific author, um, but don't be troubled about all of that. My main job is making these things work. That's what I've been doing for 20 odd years, and I'm going to describe and share with you some of the lessons that I've learned about how we transition from the spring, the excitement of building this infrastructure, to actually transitioning and operating it safely. So in order to put this sudden burst of interest in subsurface infrastructure into perspective, let's take a moment to really understand what does this Arab Spring in subsurface infrastructure really mean? Well, if we take our minds back to London and the London Underground, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, London Underground was created in 1863. It's got something like 270 stations and around 400 kilometres of tracks created over more than 150 years. What about New York? New York. New York began in 1868. Again, more than 150 years ago. And in New York, there's something like 468 stations, almost 400 kilometres of track, but over 150 odd years. And then there's a gap. And it's interesting because the, the, the spring or what we're seeing within the region is led by Cairo. Uh, Cairo in 1987, uh, its major subsurface uh, metro system, or also more recently road tunnels, with around 60 stations. Then Tehran in Iran, 1992 with its metro, planned back in the 70s then, there was the revolution, uh, and opened in uh, 1992, about 85 stations, around 150 kilometres of track. And then we've got the current spring. In Oman, we're looking at in the order of $10 billion in major infrastructure, including major expansion of subsurface infrastructure, $10 billion. United Arab Emirates already seen the development of a major amount of infrastructure, but tens of billions of dollars being spent there um, uh, now, right now. Riyadh Metro, something like 20 to 30 billion dollars being spent on Riyadh Metro uh, to transform Riyadh as part of the um, Saudi Arabian initiatives and of course Qatar with the Qatar Metro. Leave aside the drainage programs, leave aside the road programs, just the Metro project with nearly 40 billion dollars tagged for some 100 stations and a large Metro development. So the spring I'm talking about is right now right here. But it also has to be put in context. Even within the last three or four weeks, I've been in Europe, in Copenhagen, looking at their new metro. I've been in uh, Hong Kong, looking at their new developments. And of course, uh, back in continental uh, America, where there's uh, major developments occurring there and other parts of the world. So not only do we have this explosion occurring here and within our region, but the rest of the world also is quite excited about its infrastructure. So the first thing I'm going to share with you are the lessons that have been learned most recently in Europe, Asia uh, and also in the US. And they're lessons that relate to, of all things, the administrative structures that surround the operation of major subsurface infrastructure. Boring as that might sound, when we as a region are in the middle of this exciting building the infrastructure phase, actually 
the essence of the transition from building the civil engineering works to something that actually works, to building something that actually performs the function which the society is investing in, is one of the most difficult and challenging areas. And in Europe, it was one of the reasons for massive uh, disaster and loss of major infrastructure, uh, and the most severe being the Mont Blanc Tunnel disaster. I raise this with you because after the Mont Blanc disaster, the European Union conducted a special investigation and produced a new directive. And under that directive, it sets out what it believes are the administrative requirements for the proper operation of subsurface infrastructure. It's not the detail of what the European Union writes in this standard that's important. It's the substance and flavour of their recognition that you need to have an administrative authority which can intelligently and consistently administer the resources to manage the subsurface infrastructure intelligently and safely. Now, that's something which is a, is a lesson that can only be learned either the hard way, like they did in Europe, or through careful analysis of what they've produced to see the essence of what they're suggesting, and that is consistency. And what I would suggest is that within the Gulf region, the GCC countries just take the essence of what the European Union has captured in its directive and put resources into the harmonisation and proper administration of this incredibly expensive and powerful uh, infrastructure that's being produced. So that's the EU directive. Now, the second and also incredibly important uh, lesson that I think we can discuss here today is the difficulties and challenges that we face within the region, Gulf region, in delivering complex and major subsurface infrastructure in a way which actually results in something that works, that actually works. And I, I say that from professional experience, having been involved in a number of projects in the region, was essentially a construction site, merely a civil engineering site, into something that worked, something that actually satisfied the local regulator that was working safely. And for that, I think, again, as a region, there are, there are matters we can rightly discuss as we transition from the spring to the autumn. So if I could begin with what I think is the first point. In many of the countries within the region, we don't have an existing skilled workforce and we don't have a history and a legacy of managing, operating, maintaining this complex infrastructure. So what that means is we must, not we may, we must have competent technical expert assistance from expatriates. And as a region, as a region to capture uh, the the necessary expertise and to transfer that expertise into a form that can be used to um, transition to operation and actually operate uh, is uh, really um, critical uh, for the infrastructure. So what does this transition from civil engineering to safe operations look like? I'll give you an example. In a project in the region uh, recently uh, transitioned. What, what we found was that the contractual arrangements were such that many of the experts that we really needed to be there to do the transition were gone. And I'm sure many of you will be shocked for the reasons that they'd gone. Let's see, there was contractor you know, A who just disappeared, or perhaps contractor B who was never paid, or contractor C who disappeared and was never paid, uh, or contractor D who was incompetent, 
or any one of a number of other combinations of reasons that the incredibly complex, incredibly fantastic infrastructure that was built had difficulties transitioning to operation. And yet, it's the transition from operation which is what the political masters are looking for. That's what the community are looking for. They actually don't really care about the civil works. They want it to work. So what we learned, and what I'd like to share with you as part of the, uh, the transition from spring to autumn, is it takes patience. This is very much a human dimension to an engineering task. You need to find people who not only have a uh, desire to do the job, but actually have a capacity to learn and do it properly. This is multi-billion dollar infrastructure. And as you'll see from the images that uh, I'm showing you now, we did exercises. We practiced. We took the infrastructure that was built and we tested it. Not just some simple commissioning testing, really tested it so that we could understand how it really worked. And in that way, we were able to actually, really, demonstrably, to the satisfaction of our political masters, to the satisfaction of the insurers, to the satisfaction of the bankers, we actually could make it work safely. The safety regulator could come and talk to the workforce, could actually see us operating it safely. And for the region, that's new. It's not new because things aren't operated safely. No, it's new because this subsurface infrastructure is incredibly complex to operate safely. The environment that we've created is hostile. It's not a place that people are meant to live. It's a place where if things go wrong, they really go wrong, and it's almost certain that there'll be injury and death. So, the transition from construction to operation is something that's more than just a simple process, a tick of the box. It requires attention for the transition from spring to autumn. Here with Golf, it's something we must focus on. And there's even more subtle elements to it than that. Something as simple as language. It doesn't matter what language you choose in your country to speak. What matters is that everyone speaks the same language for the purposes of operating the infrastructure. Otherwise, it will be dangerous. And for that, again, I'd like to share with you the thought that for your projects, a great deal of emphasis should be placed upon the language we use, not just whether it's Arabic or English or Cyrillic or Indian or Pakistani or Nepalese or whatever it is, but the language we use to develop that language and make it a shared language between the project and the emergency services and make it work. So in summary, what I'm suggesting for the transition between the spring, the excitement, the joy of building all of this infrastructure and the challenges of the autumn actually making it work, are simple to say but in many ways more difficult to do. Firstly, we need governance arrangements, corporate governance arrangements, that brings a consistency to the overall regulation and operation of this fantastic infrastructure. And what the Europeans, the Americans and the Asians have learned is that a sophisticated administrative arrangement which includes clear definitions of responsibilities, accountabilities, and power to enforce is absolutely essential for the optimum operation of this new infrastructure. And secondly, and also very, very difficult, is the transition from the construction phase to actually operating and it's not just a contractual matter. 
It's something far more subtle. It involves an understanding of these complex machines and how they really work. It involves training people to be there to make it happen. And it means doing this with an eye to operating it literally for hundreds of years, as we've seen from London, New York, and other great cities uh, through Europe, uh, such as Berlin, Moscow. With these things in mind, in my view, we can take the excitement, the thrill and the energy of the spring, which we're currently experiencing, and transition it more efficiently and effectively into the operations, which is the autumn. Thank you for your attention.